Welcome, welcome to the part two of the API Publisher series uh, webinar of Postman, the Space Camp series. Um, this one is increased adoption of your public API. In the first one, we saw uh, the different type of documentation. Now we're going to see how you can improve it, uh, how you can share it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, my name is Alimi. I'm a developer advocate at Postman, and I'm currently uh, located in London. And I'm here with Carson. Carson, who are you? I'm Carson Hunter. I'm located in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm a technical enablement architect here at Postman. So I work on the solutions engineering team and spend a lot of time in the app, uh, writing technical content, creating example workspaces, documentation, uh, collections, stuff like that. Cool. Yeah, I always wonder as well, like you, you mentioned, you always give a new description of what you do. So that's always helpful. <laughs> that's today's description. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I like it. Um, cool. Um, so let's have a look at what we're going to do today. Um, it's going to be more or less split in five parts. Um, we we'll quickly go through the different types of API documentation, and that's kind of like the review of what we've learned in part one. So if you weren't there, that's fine, because we're just going to review that anyway. Uh, we look at advanced workflows. I'm going to ask you a few questions about what you believe these are, and then we we'll look at a few examples. Um, and then we'll go into a demo slash hands-on session and where you can follow along. So Carson is going to show us how to um, how to improve documentation, different things you can do. Um, I'll also go through how to show you like how to make a documentation interactive. And then we'll go back to uh, showing you examples of what some partners have done uh, to increase engagement of their of their documentation or their workflows. And to finish, we'll have a QA session. So again, if you have any questions, make sure that you Pop them in the Q and A button at the top, at the bottom, actually, uh, and we'll answer them at the end. And before leaving, we'll leave you with plenty of resources. Uh, anything that we would not have had time to tell you during the webinar, uh, we'll give it to you, and you can then uh, look at it later. So, with that said, here's what you learned today. Um, with everything that you'll be doing, you should be leaving uh, that webinar knowing how to explain the different types of API documentation explain how specifically Postman helps and supports these various type of API documentation, um, how to optimize the time to first call. So you'll see that coming up a lot during the webinar. The time to first call is from the moment you discover an API, a third party API, to the moment you actually make a success, successful call to that API. Uh, that's what we call the time to first call. Um, and then you should be able to identify marketing tactics for increasing engagement of that API, uh, build awareness and adoption of that API. And then the last bit, um, which is a very small one, and we mentioned during the first session already, was how to keep collection dry. And that's do not repeat yourself. So make sure that you use variables, uh, make sure that you don't share um, API keys and stuff like that. So we'll hopefully teach you all that, but we'll, we'll go through that at the end and make sure that you've learned it all. Cool. So um, I'm going to ask Joyce to put a poll up. So you should all see. Uh, Paul show up on you, um, and there should be two questions. So the first one is, how well documented are um, the APIs that you've used? So I'm talking about third-party APIs, not your API. Whenever you go out there and you need to integrate with a th third party, it can be Twitter API, Salesforce API, you name it. Um, how do you find it um, documented? Is it well documented? Is it OK documented? Is it amazingly well documented? And then the other question is, um, how long does it typically take you to make your first successful request? So again, uh, we're talking about making a request that doesn't return an error, doesn't tell you um, you don't have an API key, your API key is wrong, et cetera. So from the moment you discover that third-party API to the moment you make that first request. So I think um, we can end it now. And let's have a look. You should be, yeah, you should all be seeing the results, but I'm going to talk through them anyway. 100% um, documentation is OK. You've not seen amazing documentation. Maybe we'll show you some today. Um, you've not seen very poor documentation. Um, hopefully, we won't show you any today. Um, and then how long does it take to make your first successful request? We have 33% for a few minutes. Very good. Uh, and then in general, a few hours. I think that's, um, that's what we mostly see. But before going into that, let's go to the next poll. Uh, and this one is more about what you want to do uh, or what are your goals? Oh, let me switch. Yeah. What's your primary goal when it comes to API adoption? So again, quick poll on your screen. Um, 
so when you have your own API now and you're trying to put it out there, what's your goal for the end user? Are you trying to reduce the time to first call for them? Are you trying to inspire them to create new integration? Are you trying to get new integrations or new, um, new contributions from the community or from your users? Um, or are you trying to simply gather feedback? So let's say uh, you have an API that is in beta, you put it out there, and for now, all you want to do is, oh, I put it out there, I'm not quite sure what they're going to do with it, and just trying to get some, um, some comments. I think, ooh, I think I had that one as a multiple choice question, but I might be wrong. So if it's not multiple choice, uh, just go for the one that you want the most. <laughs> okay. So I think we'll, uh, we'll look at the results. First one is ready stamp to first call. Hopefully that wasn't uh, auto bias just because it was the first in the list, but I think that makes sense. Uh, the faster someone can get to use your API, uh, the faster they'll build something with it. And then inspire developers with use cases. Um, I think all of these are valuable, but that answers help us like, making sure that we are like the right thing during this webinar as well. So let's have a look at um, what we figured out. Oh, was I not talking through the results? Okay, so that's the result they are now showing on your um, on your screen. <laughs> the 67% to reduce time to first call, 33% uh, to inspire developer with new use cases, and we'll go we'll go through this during the uh, during the session. So I think we can stop sharing, uh, and now let's have a look at. Um, at this. So that's from the state of the API uh, report that we run every year from Postman. And we send it to, I think this one was sent to more than, uh, I'm going to say 10,000. I'm not entirely sure, but a lot of people reply to that. And I think um, you'll see that it's more or less what you've replied. So um, how well is document, how well our API is documented? Well, you can see there's a huge peak at the middle here for like 27%. Documentation is usually okay. There's a few that are very bad, badly documented, a few that are very well documented, but in general, we're right here in the middle. Uh, the other thing that um, people tend to look at when they try to improve API documentation, they want better examples. So better examples are um, all the use cases, workflows, et cetera, uh, sample code, and all of this combined reduces the time to first call. Um, so it's just a, a run one to rule them all or all to rule one. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> okay, so hopefully I've not lost anyone until now, but let's move on to um, the different types of workflows. So when you have an API, uh, it's just like we saw in the graph, right? Like you can have APIs that are not documented at all, some with just a bunch of endpoints, API reference, some that are like complete workflows. So you have um, here's my endpoints, but also here's what you can build with them, and they'll show you, um, and they'll show you. Oh, this is uh, how to build that integration with this third party. And then there's, you can have just a simple button. You click it, and then you can go and try the API. So let's uh, let's explore a bit of that uh, and see the different different types of workflows that we have. Um, so I'm going to start with Salesforce. And here I'm going to show you a few examples um, of, of different partners that we have on the API network and what they've done. So Salesforce, they have their own um, public profile. And that's their profile. You can see they have different collections uh, and they have a workspace. You can see their uh, favorite links, so how to go to their developer portal, um, how to reach out to them, or like who's working on that. Um, so that's great. Uh, next image is you have some descriptions of uh, what all these collections are for, and you can go to their workspace. So when you land on their workspace, you have access again to all these collections, and you have an overview of the workspace. So that's something that could be um, could be more useful here is how to get started. And for this one, you could have an example of a um, workspace that has an introduction, getting started, uh, what you can do with this workspace. So that's uh, Belvo. So the same, they have a public profile, they have a public workspace, but in this one, they have actually some instructions or uh, who they are, what you can do with their API, how to get started, and then obviously uh, watch, uh, keep an eye on their workspace, if there's new changes to the API, et cetera, 
um, and how to do it. So click watch on the collection, etc. So speaking of the collection, if you look at this, um, we're in one of these collection, which we call um, kind of a, a API reference. This is all their endpoints. Um, some folders are empty, some folders, and there's no really construction to it. It doesn't build something for you. All, all that it does, it tells you these endpoints are available. It's up to you to build something with that. So now let's have a look at advanced workflows. Uh, we can go to uh, Humanitech, another partner, and they have different collection. For example, this one called uh, deploy an application to a Kubernetes uh, cluster. And if you walk through this collection step by step and look through the documentation, it's going to tell you how to, just by using these endpoints one by one, deploy an entire application. So that's a great use case of showing how by leveraging their APIs and their API endpoints, uh, you can actually have something at the end. So as, a, as an end user, uh, you walk through all this and at the end you have something to be proud of, something that works, and you've learned how to use that API just by uh, going through that collection. Last thing I mentioned, if you remember the meme that I showed right before, is the button to try it out. Um, and this one, I'm actually going to leave it to uh, leave it to Carson to show because I think she's going to be going to that workspace right after. Um, so let's go back here for a second and just go to the next one. So we've seen different types of uh, workflows. We've seen um, API references. We've seen um, advanced workflows. We've seen some other things you can do in Postman to uh, to increase your presence, public profile, etc. Uh, but now let's see how, when starting from a simple uh, simple documentation, you can improve it using Postman. So I'm going to give it to Carson, uh, and she's going to walk us through some of, some of this. Yeah, so let me take over the screen. So um, I'm going to show you just a few tips on how we can take our collections a little bit further and hopefully uh, increase adoption in ways that might not be just um, writing documentation, but ways that make it a little more interactive. So if you start from your Postman homepage, if you're following along, we want to get to the Postman Space Camp workspace, which is the link that's um, on our Libby slide, and it is probably being pasted in the chat. And so if you don't have the link, you can also find it via the Postman search bar, uh, which is a great way to go to browse for anything you want. So if we type in Space Camp, we can see there's you know quite a few results. Um, we can tell that this is the one we want because it has, you know, the workspace icon. It's called Postman Space Camp, created by Postman, and it's public. So that seems like a pretty safe bet. We'll go there. And once it loads, uh, this is kind of, you know, the hub for all of the Postman Space Camp resources. So you can see uh, if we scroll down, uh, we have, you know, links to subscribe to the Postman uh, Space Camp series on YouTube. There's links to the previous recordings. And then like Arlami was mentioning, we have all of these run and postman buttons. So if you want to follow along Huge with the- um, orange buttons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just great to look at uh, and to use. So um, if you find a session that you want to follow along with, you can find the corresponding collection, click run and postman, and then you could fork it into your own workspace. And so um, today we're going to be, let me expand this. Um, increasing the adoption of our public API. But this is actually kind of the end product of what we're going to do. So this has all of the work um, for the end result. So we're actually going to start with this introduction to documentation collection that you might have seen in the previous session. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and fork this. You can use the little fork icon and we'll add a label. I'm just going to call this one Space Camp, but this is a great place to kind of give a summary of what you're going to be working on. You know, if you're changing some documentation um, that helps both you keep track of which fork this is, and then if you end up merging it back in, um, the person who's merging it can kind of tell what's going on before they look at um, your actual changes. So I'm going to choose this API publisher series workspace, um, and I'm going to say that we want to watch the original collection in case there are any changes that we want to pull in. So I'll go ahead and fork it. So the... Um, um, what does, what does the watch do? Yeah, so if Arlami had made any changes to the collection that we forked, uh, we'll get a little notification up here that says, hey, there were some changes 
this original collection, and then we could do the um, pull changes from source here um, somewhere. Is that, yeah, pull I think in it's the, the merge, merge changes. Yeah. yeah, there it is, merge changes. And that would make sure that we stay up to date um, so we don't have a lot of conflicts when we go to merge our changes back in. Cool. So um, you can see we're on our API publisher series workspace. Uh, we've got a little bit of documentation here in the workspace, and this is the collection we forked. We can tell because we have the little fork icon with our Space Camp label. Um, and so we're going to mostly be focusing on the second folder and working on adding some examples and visualizations to these requests. Um, so to start off, uh, let's talk a little bit about you know adding examples. I know this is covered a little bit at the end of the last session, but yeah. Arlami, do you want to kind of give an overview of what a Postman example is and why we might need, need that? Um, yeah, I think so. Just in case you were here the last session, you might already have that collection because that's what we built uh, last week, as, uh, last week, last session, uh, where we had like, we generated an API reference and then we just created a simple workflow. That works, workflow was very basic. Uh, an example is um, whenever, you send a request to an API, uh, you'd get a response. And as, a, as someone that reads documentation, it's always useful to know, even without using the API, what you may get as an answer. So you might be uh, integrating with this API. Let's say you're working on the front end um, and you want to know what type of uh, data it returns and then in which format it returns it, because then you can start like pinging, oh, I want to get like this specific variable and then put it right there in my UI. Um, so that's that's what examples give you. You have examples of good responses, but you also have examples of bad responses, but I think uh, Carson is going to go through that. Yeah, so um, I'll go through and show a little bit how we can save an example. So I've got this um, environment that just has my API key saved as a variable called an API key. Um, so I'm not going to show that, so I don't want to expose it, but this just uh, helps me get some live data from the New York Times uh, book API, you can see in our URL variable that it resolves. And when it comes back, we have um, an array called results of all these different books. It's got, you know, the ISBN number, um, tell us everything we'd want to know about all these books. And so, you know, if a person didn't have an API key right off the bat when they come to your collection, uh, it'd be good for them to see kind of the data that's coming back, you know, when I'm de like developing against an API. I like to get that little sneak peek before I go through the process of signing up for an API key. So this can kind of maybe help um, increase adoption that way. So if we go and do the save response button and save as an example, um, sometimes it will save it as just the name of your request, but I'm actually gonna go in and describe um, the type of request status we got back. So I'm gonna say 200 successful, and that'll just let us know you know, this is what happens if you send the request. We got the response back as expected. Um, this is what it'll look like. But, you know, that doesn't always happen. We don't always have, you know, the right credentials, the right parameters. Um, so it's good to kind of document what that looks like as well. So I'm going to go back to my request. I'm going to say, you know, currently we're inheriting the authorization from the parent. What if we send it with no authorization at all? What would that look like? So you can see we've got an error, which, you know, seems bad, but it's good to document these types of things because people will come across them. So I'm going to save this one as well. And I'm going to say, so it was a 401, whoops, but it was because we didn't have an API key. So I'm going to say no API key. And so now we can see we have these two example uh, request saved and people can see these without having to actually send the request. Um, and I did want to show, you know, we can see how these show up in the Postman, you know, Web API and the Postman app, they show up under the request. But if you do end up publishing your documentation, they'll also show up there as well. Um, we showed how you can use the response statuses as a naming convention, but I found this um, other API that I'm familiar with uh, from MTNA where they are also describing kind of a polymorphic response. So depending on the request parameters you send, 
Um, they'll send back the response in a different format to kind of comply with these different charting libraries. Um, so that's another interesting use as well to kind of document different types of responses that you could get back from an API. So um, Arlem is gonna do a little bit more with this in the next section, but uh, I'll go ahead and you know save this response as well, just so we have a successful one there. Yeah, I think um, it, it's great because we're going to show, this is the st static way of showing what would be coming back. But we, we did mention right before how you can make that dynamic. Um, so that's spoilers for later or teaser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, if we go and we're looking through this data uh, as someone coming to the API and using it for the first time, it can be kind of overwhelming to just see this massive you know, chunk of JSON return. There's a lot of lines here. Uh, and so I wanted to go over a little bit how we could use visualizers to make this a little bit more accessible. Um, so I'll go through and make sure I have my authorization set up again, but so we'll send this, see that we're getting the JSON back and, um, we'll start to set up a visualizer. So you might be familiar with Postman visualizers as, you know, charts and graphs that people have set up to display data, but they don't always have to be, you know, some fancy interactive thing. They can also just kind of help you consume data in a more readable way. Um, so I've got actually something that I will copy and paste. You don't have to watch me type live um, and save this all some pain, but I will just paste this here and then let's go through this uh, a little line by line so we can talk about what's happening. So here we are saving this results array that we showed earlier um, as a constant called results so we can use it in our visualizer. These are what's going to be uh, displayed in our table. Um, this is saving the first author that we find as a collection variable, which we don't need right now. Um, and then we're setting up, let me close this, a variable called template. And this is actually where we'll define our kind of HTML handlebars template that will be displayed in the visualized tab. So you can see we've got a very simple table here. Um, we're defining our headers. We'll display the rank, the title, and the author of these books. And for each um, entry in our response array, we'll go through and create a row that has their rank, their title, and the author, just pulling those from each of the entries in the array. And then finally, we'll go through and tell Postman that we want to set up a visualizer with PM visualizer set. We'll pass in our template and then pass in that results array um, to populate the- yeah, if, you're, um, if you're following along, I've pasted the code in the chat, so you don't have to just try and frantically type as uh, Carson goes through the description, you can copy paste. And ideally awesome. you should have the same result. Cool, so let's see what this looks like. Hopefully it works. We'll go to the visualize template and it works. So you can see we have a very simple table that just displays rank, title, author. I think it's a lot easier to consume this information in this way as opposed to scrolling through the whole JSON response. And of course you can you know, jazz this up in any manner you want to. Um, this is a great starting template. And so um, kind of once we've added all of these elements to our you know, collection, we put this time into it, uh, it might be worth you know, updating our documentation to let people know um, kind of what's available. So one thing I like to do when I've taken the time to add a visualizer is to add a little screenshot of it. Um, I like to do it in the request documentation as well as maybe the collection documentation and the workspace level documentation. Um, so I'll show you kind of what that looks like. I've also got something copy and pasted here that I'll uh, paste into our request documentation. So if you click on this little um, pages icon, you can see this pulls out the documentation for the request. I'll click the pencil um, and then I'll just paste this in. Um, you can see I've included an image. This is the markdown kind of syntax for that, just an exclamation point, your alt text, and then your link to your image. And if we preview this, it's just got um, a little picture of what people can expect so that they know to click over to the visualize tab because sometimes it can be easy to miss that. Um, and also if you publish your docs, um, they won't be able to access your visualizer right there, but it's good to see the little um, image so they know that they can click the run and postman button and run it that way. 
And so we could also add this into our collection documentation, That's something that I'll paste in there. Um, I think it's never a bad idea to kind of, you know, over explain what you've done since there are a lot of places that you can check for documentation. People might not check every single place. Um, so it's good to um, put it kind of wherever you think it might be found. So I'll save that. And you can see now I've got a little, you know, teaser of where they can find that uh, table that we made. So um, I think now I'll hand it back over to Arlami, unless you had anything else to add on um, things we could do to, you know, jazz up these requests and make them a little easier to consume. Um, so we looked at the example responses, uh, we added a visualizer, and then we added a documentation about it in the uh, request level and at the document as a collection level. Uh, no, I think that that was good. I know uh, Jim asked on the chat uh, that he couldn't copy paste the code, so I just sent a link that gets you to that um, that same request where you can copy uh, copy the code if you were not able to copy it earlier. So you should still be able okay. to do it. Um, cool. All right. So let me um, let me take over the screen sharing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so should seem pretty familiar because that's exactly what Carson was sharing earlier. I mean, the same workspace. So the um, that's public workspace. That's just where we work in. Uh, but at the end, we'd share that in the space camp one. So you don't really have to, to care about this one. So you can see what's, uh, what she's done, right? Like she's added example responses for that endpoint. And I can see here, I have 200 successful and no API key. And I actually don't have an API key. So if I'm someone that just visits that workspace, I can come in here and see, oh, how does a successful response spike? Cool. How does an API key look? Uh, no API key look. And that's how it looks. But it's not that easy to consume. Uh, it's still me going in here, looking at how it looks, uh, and then making assumption that, oh, when I'm going to call it from my app, this is how it's going to work. So now, as, a, as an API publisher, um, I might not want to open the API to everyone, right? Like if the if the New York Times um, requires an API key to use their API, there's a reason, right? Like it's not open. Um, some people will make it so uh, you have to pay to consume their APIs. Some people will have like um, a rate limit, so you can only call it a certain amount of times. Uh, but what you can do, uh, you can use mock servers in Postman to simulate that API based on the example responses. So that's what I'm going to go, uh, it's what I'm going to, to do. So what I'll do, I'll look at that uh, that collection and I'm going to mock it. So I'll go in the parameters here and click mock collection. So this opens this new tab now, create a mock server and I'll call this one uh, top book reviews NYT mock. Uh, See, it's already pre-selected for the collection I want to use. Um, I can select an environment to be used. Um, I'm actually not uh, going to select one because I don't want to use the one where there's an API key already. That would be cheating. I go, I'm going to save it as a new environment. Another thing I could do is mock, make the mock server private, um, but that would be a bit against the point of like making it open for everyone. But let's say I'm working for with a specific partner or I'm working a specific community, for example, like a, a university, and I want them to be able to access that mocked data, I can make the mock server private, and that's going to uh, create an API key that would be required to call that uh, that mock server. And then the last thing I can do uh, is simulate the fixed network, network delay. That's more for testing reasons. We don't really care about that in uh, in that scenario because we really just we just want people to get started with the API as fast as possible. So that would be a little bit against the point. Um, so let's go ahead. Click create mock server. And I have uh, a mock server. No one has called it yet, but I can see this next URL that should be saved uh, as an environment. So I can see I have this new environment called top book reviews in uh, New York Times mock. But for now, um, if I keep on coding this, it's still going to revert to uh, that, uh, that base URL. So send it, 
should complain, I don't have an API key. So now let's change that, right? If I look at my, my environment that was just created, that's the one. And I have that variable called URL, and it has uh, an initial value, a current value. So let's replace that to be base URL. And that's where you can see the value of variables, right? Uh, one of the things that we want you to come out with uh, from that webinar is knowing how to avoid repeating yourself. Whenever you're building collections or you're building workflows, et cetera, you already know that there's going to be stuff that is going to be the same at different places. The base URL, the API version, uh, maybe your API key is going to be used at different places. So using variables is a good way uh, to avoid having to repeat yourself. So just by changing that name, uh, that variable here, now I can see that this reverts to uh, my mob server. And if I go to any of these other uh, requests, they will also um, resolve to my mock server. So now let's see what happens if I call it. Um, now if I call it, um, so there is an error in the tests. Um, but I can see I have an example of response here. Even though I'm just calling effect server, uh, I can see there's a 200 OK. Uh, I can see there's a response. I could start building on top of that. Um, and that's great, right? I didn't need an API key from the New York Times. Um, as an API publisher, I can give that to someone without risking them to, um, to attack my server, for example, using that, or uh, having them like maybe crawl through the data. This is just one example response. That's enough to start building on it or like try to see what the API gives. Um, but then if they want to start consuming more, they'll have to register um, and or if they want live data. Same, uh, let's say I didn't have authorization. So I'm going to say no auth and send it. Tells me no uh, API key available. And that's because, again, it's based on these examples. So how does that work? Uh, when Carson set up these examples, what they did, they basically registered how the request was built. So which parameter they were, uh, which headers, which uh, what if there was a body, and if so, what was in there? And then it's just doing a simple match. Um, in this case, when I send that request to my mock server, um, it matched a request that did not have authentication. Therefore, it sent back that response. Again, it's really just a mock server at the end. There's no, um, there's no intelligence or there's no uh, code whatsoever. It's really just a match of what you send to it and then it's going to send the appropriate response. So that's the that's the mock servers in a nutshell. Uh, a great way to give your users a simple way to consume your API without having them to go through a registration process. That's the one. Uh, without having them uh, having to maybe pay for consuming the API, uh, and all that again to reduce the time to first call. Right? Like if you give them that URL and they know it's going to be public and they can use it straight away. Um, that, that helps in that sense. OK, so the other thing we saw, keep, um, keep your collections or keep your documentation dry. Don't repeat yourself. Uh, leverage variables. The same way I'm using Bezreal here, if I had an API key, or the same way uh, Carson has done it, she has an API key here. Um, and you know how she mentioned she didn't want to share it because uh, obviously she doesn't want you to see the API key. Um, because she's used the current value to store the API key, I'm a third party, even though I'm in the same workspace. Uh, the current value is never shared between, uh, between users. This is local to your account. Uh, so all I see is a placeholder, which is API key. Uh, I could put mine here. She would never be able to access it, et cetera. Um, so that's another good thing with variables. Because you're not hard coding your API key in there, um, no one is able to, to steal it from you. Uh, no one is able to see it. Uh, and it's just your own, your own thing. So variables, good to avoid repeating yourself. Leverage initial and current values. So current values for uh, personal data, initial values for uh, URLs or anything that is not sensitive. Cool. Um, let me go back to slides quickly. Did I miss anything? Or does it look good? 
Yeah, that sounds good. The only thing I kind of forgot to mention, you know, maybe it's kind of common sense, but when you do say those examples, you know, make sure you're not storing any sensitive data, um, especially if you're keeping your, you know, mock server public. Uh, good to make sure that's kind of like a generic response. Um, True. Since people won't have an API key. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to save uh, an an example response with users data, uh, all these kind of stuff. Obviously, it's just. And you see um, a lot of people that are leveraging uh, this type of saving responses. They um, they just replace the uh, any data by placeholders. There's going to be a username, address one two three etc. Okay, so hopefully you've been able to follow through with all this. I see we have uh, something in the chat. Okay, just thank yous. Very nice. So hopefully it means you've been able to follow through. Um, now let's have a look at um, how do you make people aware of that, right? Um, you have you have this beautiful documentation, this beautiful workflow, but what's what's the point if no one knows about it, right? Like it's out there, um, but people need to be able to access it. People need to be able to find it. Uh, how do you make your users aware that there's this great resource for them to get started with the API? Um, if you haven't watched Squid Game. Watch it, uh, but that's a different discussion we can have on an, <laughs> on another platform. Uh, cool. So let's have a look at that now. Um, first thing I want to mention: there's in-product ways to discover your API. So you saw how Carlson, uh, when she got started with finding the space cam thing, she just leveraged the search. So from here, uh, let's say I want to use which APIs? Maybe the Stripe API. Type in Stripe. Cool. I can find them. Um, there's another way to discover um, other APIs. Let's say I'm I'm in Postman, I'm a user, and I start building um, I start building my own my own uh, requests, and I'll start playing with the Twitter API. So I'm going to go ahead, type in api.twitter.com/v1, um, and just by putting this, Postman is able to detect that oh you're using um, there's other collections that are using this same base URL. So you might be interested in the Twitter developer labs collection. And so instead, as a, as a user, instead of recreating or reinventing the wheel, I can go in, click fork, and just bring it to my workspace. Uh, this may already contain works, um, workflows. This may already contain like the API reference. Uh, whatever it contains is better than starting from scratch. Um, so that's the, that's the in-product ways. Um, to discover to discover um, API co collections, et cetera. But now let's have a look at what some uh, partners have done uh, to make their users aware. Because a lot of people use Postman, uh, but they might not be aware that that specific uh, company has a collection there. So here's a few examples. Um, some of the partners are doing blog posts, right? Um, blog posts or their blog is where their users are. Um, so that just announced that they have a public workspace. Um, some uh, some text of what is Postman, um, why they built it, and what's the value in it, right? As a user, I want to make sure that um, I know why I should get started with that. And then you can see um, there's a call out at the end. You can click that. It's going to follow the collection directly. Uh, or you can just go in and visit the collection uh, from, from their announcement. So that's one way to do it. Uh, do a blog post, just announce it to your users, let them know it's there for them to leverage. Another way to do it, uh, which often works, is a video. Um, Salesforce, so Philly from Salesforce is one of the person that we've worked with. Um, they have this walkthrough of how to get started with the Salesforce API uh, using Postman. So it just walks through. Um, that's a nice way. I'm guessing if you're here, it's because you like to consume video content. Um, it's a nice way to follow through, follow along someone that teaches you how to use the API, but also Postman. Um, so that's, I'm not gonna play that video, but hopefully you understand the concept. Um, another thing that can be done is to get as close as possible to your users, right? Um, if, I'm, if I wanna consume an API, I'll probably go to that provider and I'll go to their documentation. Um, I'll have a look at uh, what's available. Do they have some examples, et cetera? So what Microsoft did, uh, they actually have a page 
on their documentation, which, um, and the reason why they actually created that page is because uh, they did some research on what were the most searched terms in their documentation. And Postman was one of the one of the top search terms in their own documentation. So they now have that page. Anyone looking for Postman can land there. And again, this is just a tutorial on how to get started with uh, the Microsoft Graph API using Postman. So this one is getting as close as possible to the developer. Um, and we have other examples of embedding uh, embedding Postman in the documentation. Some have a whole page. Some will just have running Postman buttons. And that's the one that Carson showed a while ago. Um, you click on it, forks the collection. So this one shows there's different ways to get started. Uh, we have Okta. They have a page which is full of running Postman buttons. Uh, you can't miss them. Uh, Twitter, uh, they have a running Postman button on each of their endpoint page. Uh, so you can go through the API and for each of these endpoints, you, you have a running Postman button. Um, so that's the, that's the different ways to let your uh, users aware of it and increase adoption of it, right? Like you've spent this time creating this workflow, you spent this time creating that, uh, that collection. Now you want to make sure it's being used. The last thing uh, that I want to mention and that we had in the questions is collaboration. Uh, there's different collaboration that you may want to get also from creating these things. Um, for example, here we have Dolby. Um, they've worked with another third party, which is called Symbol AI. And they have this shared, uh, this shared partner workspace uh, where they work together and they have this collection. And you can see how to, uh, how to integrate with both of these solutions. So that's one way you can do it. But the other way to do it is also just to open, um, to open submissions to your users, uh, to anyone. Uh, and we look at uh, MTNA, which is uh, an API that Carson mentioned earlier. Um, and what they have in their workspace and what's interesting is they have this uh, submission template collection. So people can come in, fork this to their workspace, add whatever they feel like uh, they want to share or what they want to create, and then create a pull request. And then from the MTNA side, they can review the, the pull request they can see if it's valuable to have in the public workspace and they can accept it. And now you have this new collection coming from the community. Um, the other thing you can do, you can come in just in that workspace. If you have any comment to do uh, on this one, for example, uh, I can go and leave a comment at the collection level. If there's something I don't understand on a specific uh, request, I can go in and say, oh, uh, shouldn't this be ISO 3165, not that I know what it means, but you know, you could get into details like this. And as the, as the publisher, you get the direct feedback. Uh, you get the direct questions from the, from the users. Cool. Let's go back to the slides. And I'm going to start from that slide because I like this meme. So I just want to show it one more time. Okay. We're done. Tons of stuff we've done. Um, we talked a lot, but let's make sure that we, or you actually got uh, whatever you were here to get. So ideally you can now see the difference between a different type of API documentation, an API reference, which is just a list of endpoints, workflows, which is how to build something and the guide is, how do I get started with that API? Um, explain how Postman support these various types of documentation. Um, we've seen that by um, when Carson went from the, uh, the API reference, then we looked at the very simple uh, workflow that she improved by adding examples, et cetera. Um, optimize time to first call. That's adding examples. That's mocking the collection. Uh, that's just genuinely putting as much information as you can into your, into your collection, right? Like you don't want people to have to look for information. Uh, you want to give it to them. Uh, the different marketing tactics can be a video, a blog, um, anything really, um, awareness. That's also part of that, right? Like you want to make sure that your users, um, are aware of that. So that can be in your docs. Uh, documentation is a place where users will go. That's oftentimes the most visited place in any developer portal. Um, so let people know that there's, uh, there's stuff in there and then, um, avoid repeating yourself and leverage variables to make sure that anything that you have on your. Uh, any variables that are sensitive data um, are kept secure. Um, some teaser for 
uh, for later. Um, I think we've mentioned some of them in the in the previous session, but if you weren't there, um, we have what you see is what you get coming up. So you may have seen Carson uh, when she was editing documentation, right? You still have to write text. Um, she had to add parentheses, then brackets, etc. Uh, we'll have a full on um, edit mode that's coming up where you can just click on buttons, select text, say that's a link, type in your link, uh, that's it. So that's coming up soon. Um, you've seen how you can fork uh, collections. We've done that a lot today. Um, you'll soon be able to fork an API. So the value in that is that an API can have a bunch of collections attached to it. So you'll be able to bunch um, bunch fork stuff, right? Like you put that API and that API comes with an API reference, some workflows, et cetera, instead of like going and forking a collection one by one. And there's more, but if you want to know more, there's a link to the public roadmap, uh, which we update um, pretty frequently uh, with anything that comes out. And that can be related to documentation or not. Uh, that's the general public roadmap for, uh, for Postman. So I'm now going to give it to Carson, who's going to handle the Q&A. Awesome. Yeah, so let me check the Q&A box. Looks like we've only got one question right now. So if anyone else has any questions, feel free to type them in. But Jim asks, is it possible to do a private public collection to allow access to a limited group of Postman account users? We have APIs, but they aren't public, but it would be lovely if we could give them the try it out button. Arlene, do you have any suggestions for kind of how that could be implemented? So, um... I'm guessing that question means all these people are not part of your team. There are people from other teams. Uh, you might be working with specific partners. So for now, there isn't like a, oh, let me just go back here. There isn't a, an out of the box solution, but it's coming. So that's one of the things that I probably should have mentioned in the coming soon. So if you look at uh, API network here, so we have the private API network, which is uh, within your team. Uh, anyone that is part of your Postman account can access it. We have the public API network, which is what we've been working from during this whole webinar. Uh, anything that we do is on out there. Uh, you don't even need an account to access it. And then we have the partner API network that's coming soon, uh, which is exactly what you've described, right? Like you'd be able to uh, handpick who can access that. So TLDR, no, uh, but soon. So keep an eye out. Um, you have the public roadmap if you want to stay, stay alert of when it's coming out. Um, or just follow our socials um, and it would be, I'm sure we'll talk about it a lot because that's something that is highly requested by uh, our users. Cool. And do you know if, you know, you generate the try it out button in Postman, if anyone can access that or do they have to have the right permissions um, to access the collection that's linked to the run in Postman button? That is a good question that I do not have the answer uh, to right now. Um, but I'm guessing if you really want just like a few people to have access to it, then um, that button could just be hidden in that partner workspace. Um, and I, I think that's like anything that is hidden behind a, behind a paywall, right? You, you can't block people from taking a screenshot and sharing it, unfortunately. Um, so that, that would be, that would probably be the case. But to be seen, I don't know. We'll see, we'll see when it's yeah. released. <laughs> cool. I think that's all of our questions. Awesome. So we do have a few more resources. Uh, if you still have some questions, still have some curiosities, we've got some great things that you can check out. Um, this first one is the Postman Space Camp Workspace. Um, this is what I showed earlier. It's kind of, you know, the hub for all things Space Camp. Uh, it's got the link to the YouTube. It's got all of the collections that you can fork and follow along with. Um, a great place to start if you're looking um, to cover any topic um, and like to follow along in this format. Next is the Galaxy API adoption. This is another uh, Postman Public workspace and the name Galaxy corresponds to the Galaxy conference that we had earlier this year. Um, and this is a workspace that has several training collections that you can go through. So as you work through these different collections, you'll learn different things about, you know, APIs and how to structure collections. And when you complete the training, you can submit your answers and hopefully get a Postman badge. So if you've seen people on the community forum with little labels beside their name, little badge, uh, this is one way you can get one for yourself. Um, the next one is increasing adoption of an API with the public workspace. 
This is a blog post written by Joyce Lynn that is a great resource for, you know, all the things we've covered in this webinar series. It's got, you know, examples of good public workspaces, you know, checklists for things you can do to increase adoption and just good practices and ways to kind of measure success once you've already done these things. Um, it's a great read. I highly encourage taking a look at that. And then finally is the community forum, which is, you know, a great friendly place to ask your questions, see what other people have asked. Um, it's got all the upcoming events um, and people kind of show what they're working on. Uh, it's a great place to browse um, and just get a look at what's going on inside the Postman community. Do you have any, and all those links. do you have any upcoming events you want to talk about? I actually have one tomorrow. There's a stream <laughs> that Joyce Neal, along with Neil Studd and I are doing. Um, it's in the afternoon, I can't remember the time, but it's called Testing for Busy Developers, I think. And so Neil is you know, a very good tester and I'm a busy developer. So he's gonna kind of show me some tips uh, that I can implement and hopefully increase the quality of my code. Cool. What about you, Arla, me? Um I'll actually be speaking at a conference called Web Unleashed on Friday, uh, but I can only recommend the stream as well tomorrow. Uh, I'll be watching from the from the sidelines. Perfect. Awesome. And lastly, we have a link to this um, survey that we like to send out after all the different webinars. Um, would love if you guys took a couple minutes to just fill out, you know, what you liked, what you didn't like, what we could do better. Um, and things you'd like to see in upcoming webinars. Uh, we really you know, do look at this feedback and use it to plan these future sessions and would really love um, to hear what you guys are thinking and what you liked. And I think all of those links are being pasted in the chat. Yep, there's the yep. link for the survey. It'll be emailed to you after, right, Arlemi? Yep, so um, I've pasted the link in the chat with the HTTPS so you can actually click on it. Um, and we'll be sharing it in the by email as well. But as as Carson, Carson mentioned, uh, we we do take into account that feedback. So please do answer because that helps us. Yeah, I think that's all we have. Um, we want to thank you guys so much for taking the time out of your day to attend. Uh, we hope you learned something valuable about increasing adoption of your APIs. We can't wait to see your public workspaces. And um, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.